Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I am for the moment, for the last few days uh, of my tenure here, I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation. Since the pandemic struck, we put about 430 videos up on our website, covering a whole range of issues that we were covering in the real world. I don't suppose that any of them related to space exploration, to space investment, but space is big business. I was reading something by Sinead O'Sullivan uh, from, uh, from Har the Harvard Business School saying that space investment, uh, space infrastructure investment hit 14.5 billion of private investment last year. There are ETFs on space, the ARC has got into it. Uh, and there is something that really fascinated me. Now space indices, uh, Promus has a space index. Uh, and there is also the Financial Times is jumping on this particular bandwagon. There is a conference on investing in space in London on June the 8th and 9th. Now, I don't want to give the FT a puff, but nonetheless, it was my employer at one stage. So, you know, let's uh, let's give it a little puff and I hope you can all go to it. But this is a, a, a primer. This is really important stuff. And I'm delighted that we have a really eminent panel. Uh, the kickoff speaker is James Anderson. James is a partner at Skadden Arps. Uh, he speaks regularly on taxation of space and on space law, and he has driven this particular event, but he's not the only speaker. Ariel Ekblau is the founder and director of the MIT Space Exploration Initiative, which is, and I quote, actively prototyping the artifacts of our sci-fi space future whatever the hell that means. She has a PhD from MIT in space, ar in space architecture. Uh, or, and what she's working on at the present time is the automat automaticity self-assembly space uh, architecture for future space tourist lab. God only knows what I'm, I said here, like habitats and space stations. If it's, autom if it's automatically self-assembling, self she can sell it to Ikea as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and Jody Barton, uh, who is the CEO at Citicorp, which is, I guess, a boutique investment um, advisory firm. She, uh, was, uh, previ uh, she's, she was previously the MD there and has uh, what worked with, and I quote again, multiple near and low earth orbit space sector companies. I'm way out of my depth, but I really want to ask Ariel just first to talk a little bit about what she's up to with the MIT Space Exploration Initiative, because it sounds, well, it sounds amazing. Ariel, the floor is yours. Well, Andrew and team, thank you so much for having me. It's a delight to be able to talk to the community today. I'm coming from MIT, and the work that we do here is focused on building out the human lived experience of space. We are at this really privileged point where we're at this cusp of being able to return to an expansive human presence in space. Many of us had this dream, right, whether we were around uh, ourselves in the Apollo era or not, that you could look up at the stars and think you were really going to get to go. And then we had this interregnum, this period of um, NASA and Russia and other spacefaring nations really focusing on low Earth orbit with Mirror and the International Space Station. But where now many countries are pivoting towards a focus on lunar settlement in the near future, being able to support life on the surface of the moon. Um, some groups, space billionaires, others already thinking about life on Mars. So the work that we do at my group here at MIT, the Space Exploration Initiative, we build prototypes, real hardware of space agricultural units that will feed us in the future or fermented food. We need space beer, we need space sourdough. We also work on robotics to assemble habitats that will house humanity or house subsets of humans that can actually go and travel to space. We work on everything from the infrastructure to the virtual reality uh, and the playful entertainment that will keep us happy and mentally healthy on a deep duration space mission. And what really distinguishes my organization is rather than simply being a deep science research group or a speculative architecture design firm, we build these prototypes, we launch them to space. So we regularly do missions to the International Space Station. We fly students and their projects on what is affectionately known as the Vomit Comet, <laughs> uh, parabolic flight, which simulates weightlessness. It actually does produce free fall. And so you do a roller coaster maneuver in the sky 30 to 40 times. 
And across these different opportunities for microgravity or space environment testing, we are able to assess and improve and iterate on these prototypes and then hopefully spin out companies that maybe Jody will invest in in the future or will um, be of interest to James for other parts of this call. So <laughs> I'll pop there and i um, happy to continue enjoying the conversation later on. Law lawyers will make money, whatever. However <laughs> you, you phrase this, lawyers will always take 10% of it. The word that's, that jumped out of your website was anthropocosmos. Mm. I love that word. Just tell me what you mean by it. So this is a philosophical notion that we've coined here at MIT to build on the sense of understanding that we now have about the Anthropocene, this period of human activity coming to dominate the planet for better and as we now know for worse as well. And so what are our responsibilities as stewards of the space commons? I think we're gonna get into this debate a little bit later about whether it's communal, owned by no one, owned by everyone. What are our responsibilities as stewards of the space commons as we go out into this dawning new era of the anthropocosmos, a period of expanded human activity beyond Earth, but in Earth and in space? Great. Okay, bring us back to Earth, James. James Thanks, Andrew. Andrew. Thank off. you. Thank you very much. So we at Skadden like this phrase, architecture of space, which is the title for today, because it reflects very much how space has moved on in the last three, five, ten years. Um, I hate to say exponentially, but certainly incredibly uh, rapidly. And we now see a series of components coming together, probably for the first time, which allows space to be seen, certainly through a lawyer's lens, as this very coherent or increasingly coherent private and public space, um, which has got classic mixtures uh, we've seen uh, globally for, for, for decades and, and indeed centuries of capitalism. So this mixed public and private space is geopolitical, but it's also quite clearly negotiable and investable. So um, if you think about it and picking up a little bit on what Ariel was saying, space has been on a bit of a journey itself. It inhabited our imagination for many years. It's been in poems and films and books, the whole sci-fi era of the mid 20th century, moved into the national and international space um, effectively as uh, areas for countries to, to seek domination uh, and, and, and scientific endeavor. But now, as I said, for the last three, five, 10, 15 years, rapid acceleration of the capitalist angle, the private investor angle. And so for us, the architecture of space is a very handy catch-all phrase, which, and we'll go through the, the headings in a minute, signifies this, this coming together of different components, which means that lawyers, bankers, as well as the philosophers and scientists, um, such as Ariel, can, can step in and make a contribution to the development of a, of a brand new um, part of uh, our habitat, an Anthropocene habitat, as Ariel will have it. So um, what does that actually mean? Well, one banker crudely put it to me. They're, they're always um, first out there with the phrase, it's now um, Bucks Rogers of the 21st century. And I've obviously aged myself by saying that. Um, reference to a, a, an 80s TV show that was, was horrific, but is now being remade by George Clooney, just to show you that space is coming back. Um, yeah, I mean, it really is a place now where uh, these different components work. So the first area which is very important to us is investable components and there's lots of ways you can break out what you can invest in in space and we're going to hear uh, later on today about those different segments but one one designation would be to call these segments uh, first of all build components so living pods rockets hardware software things you actually need to get into space aerial's been clearly prototyping and launching then you've got the whole launch and land infrastructure, which is incredibly expensive. Launch pads, the communities that grow up around these launch pads, access to the necessary resources. Um, there's a whole data capture and transmission world to invest in, and that's through a mixture of drones, satellites, uh, UAVs, etc. Then there's an area called downlink, which is all about the radio uh, and the transmission and the ground stations, which is effectively getting the signals back down to Earth. That's a whole new uh, sector to invest in. And then finally, we would call it harvesting, which is a, a way of uh, developing our knowledge about what's come down from space and, and, and learning about the data, using the data, interrogating the data to see how we can improve things like, for example, avoiding collisions in space and avoiding debris being uh, jettisoned in a dangerous way. So that's what we would start to call, I suppose, the, the investable components as part of the architecture of space. Then we move on to, I think, where the lawyers get more excited, which is what we call the regulatory components. And 
this has got a few features. First of all, there clearly is the law, but there's an open question. I think Andrew's dying to dig into it. What is the law in space? And I think that's a very difficult question um, to answer. Then you've got clearly sovereign interactions, which aren't quite clearly the law. It's just what sovereigns do in space. Um, but clearly what the sovereigns do in space is, is itself a very important fact, which you have to deal with. And there are some regulatory constraints on that, although not that many. And then I guess we'd also look at governance and oversight at a corporate level as these businesses I'm talking about come into the, the sector, you know, how are they uh, reconciling to their shareholders, their stakeholders, exactly what they're doing from, a, from an ecology perspective, from an investment return perspective, um, how can they justify their actions when actually it could be a punt into the unknown, almost literally. Um, then we move on to finance. Now, finance is one of these areas that has really exploded in the last three to five years, and we're going to hear again about that in more detail. But because it is something that's evolved rapidly. It's moved from being national budgets funding incredibly expensive missions to you know, hesitant at first, but increasing number, number of equity participants in the private space. So you know, deep, deep funding on the venture basis. Um, and now we're starting to see the evolution into debt, which is a, brings a whole new uh, ball game in terms of security, uh, diligence, et cetera, convertible debt. Etc. So we're starting to see the whole range of um, capital stacks start to come to play. As part of the insurance, uh, the finance world, sorry, the insurance sector is getting very interested. A lot of this used to be uninsurable. In fact, the government's naturally self-insured. Uh, it was just them behind themselves, effectively. Now we're seeing private actors, they're going to want insurance and insurance providers are now pricing it in a way that they wouldn't have done, say, 10 years ago. They just didn't have the, the, the maths to be able to do that. And then finally, within the finance component, we have risk mapping, which is a it's a way of putting together a few disparate seg seg segments of the analysis, not just for financiers, but for um, borrowers, for equity providers, to try and figure out just what their return profile is post-risk. And then finally, and probably more um, uh, esoterically than, than any of the preceding three components, so we've done investable, we've done regulatory, we've done finance, the philosophy components. Now, at this point, you're, you're probably all thinking, well, hang on, this is way off piste. But actually, philosophy of space is quite a real thing. And... It goes to responsibility for actions in space. Can humans actually uh, go out there and do what they like? It introduces this whole concept of, uh, I think we're going to talk about a bit more, terra nullius versus terra omnium communis versus condominium, which is the Antarctic model. Um, what do we do with resources that we find up in space? Should we allow human centers to develop, e.g. on the moon, with their own rules, self-policing self effectively? Uh, impact on the Earth's environment, and that can be uh, light environment, as we're seeing with um, some of the satellite launches, or it could be actual you know, danger to life as, as a result of uh, crashes in space, which end up affecting us on Earth. All those things have got a very heavy philosophical component. And I know there are people out there, including Ariel, who are very focused on this, um, this topic. So I'll, I'll pause there, Andrew. I'm sure there's an awful let, lot. Let me ask you, though, to, to talk a little bit more about the law or the absence of law in space, because you've talked about terra nullius or whatever it is. And I kind of get get that there is a real controversy over this, but we've had, you know, we've been dis disputing the, the law of the sea for at least 40 years that I know of. Um, what's the, Where does the law of space stand at the present time? Depends which country you ask um, and whether they've signed up to various of the agreements. <laughs> uh, so it's a mess at the moment, I would say. There isn't a clear enforceable law that governs space. Even the concept of space is subject to some dispute some countries have a different view as to when space space starts above earth and that in itself is 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 a challenge um to give you a very simple answer most law in space exists at the international or intranational level in other words there are some treaties which regulate performance by countries in space um not quite enforceable but they take the form of treaties uh, and that's pretty much the simple answer. Um, obviously, people uh, on Earth want that to move on. Private sector individuals want to be able to write their own laws. Um, enforceable where? We don't know. Uh, we've got issues around enforceability, even of those international laws. So you might find that a country has breached a treaty to which it is a party, um, like the Outer Space Treaty, to which many countries are actually party. Bringing a case before the International Court of Justice is extremely challenging. Um, but there are there are processes now going on to try and resolve that problem. Um, and there are sort of mock trials which people are holding to try and simulate what actually would be an example of a case at the International Court of Justice in relation to a, 
uh, a collision in space. Um, I guess the, fi the final point is really around how do you, in, in space, regulate the actual things we put into space? So on the International Space Station or, or any lunar colony, as, as Ariel um, mentioned, and I think J Jody would be um, uh, indirectly helping finance, Within those confines, what, what, law, what sort of law should apply? Which nationalities law should apply? Mm -hmm. Because we're not only talking about movements between extraterrestrial objects, which may be falling into the treaties, but should any particular nation's rules apply to, you know, homicidal acts or, 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 or environmental damage? That's a very, very hot topic. It's been kicked around um, by many countries. I would say one thing, though, and I, and I was only half joking, depending on which country you ask, Countries like China are busy writing their own view of what should be private law in space, in Mandarin, of course. And the Americans are, are doing this. The Europeans are wanting to do this. And at the moment, we have an unresolved conflict looming, which is you know, just exactly who's going to get there first to come up with a very coherent and acceptable set of rules that are governing activities and things like the ISSS. So let, let, a practical example, if, so, if somebody has launched a billion-dollar satellite and it is wiped out by debris from, say, a another satellite, uh, and they come to Skadden Ops, what do you say to them? Who can you sue? Um, it's very difficult. You, you, as a private owner, would have to ask the country of your launch um, to instigate proceedings, presumably initially diplomatically, um, but certainly one would hope there would be some recourse to arbitration at some point at the International Court of Justice or some other standing court of uh, arbitration um, as happened with the Chagos Islands, for example. Um, th this is a concept of due regard, which is quite well known within international law. Th th this, this concept of a one nation doing something without due regard to the rights of, uh, of others, it's in the law of the sea, it's in the Outer Space Treaty. We'd be advising uh, our, our clients to look at whether the nation which governs the launch, the rules of the nation that governs the launch, could be um, used to instigate a national complaint against the other nation. And then looking for some remedy, which uh, unfortunately is loose at the moment, but through either the ICJ or the Standing Court of Arbitration, as which happened in the Chagos Islands. But it's very, very difficult. And so actually, that's why I take us back to the first instance um, of uh, where the finance world is, is interested, which is insurance. You're actually more likely to get a payout from your insurers than you are from another country or indeed another private actor, because there is no clear locus um, to, to, to call upon and, and no law clearly to, to, to invoke. The, the other part of the answer to your question, Andrew, is um, could, could you just simply go up and not just um, know who's going to be sued if you crash into uh, someone or they crash into you, but if you go up and take something from the moon, is anyone going to stop you either in law or, or, or physically within the law? Um, and the short answer to that is, again, we don't know. Uh, and, it, and it will come on to this probably later, but there is a, a debate which we couldn't tell our clients clearly is, is answerable as to whether the Outer Space Treaty, um, which is the most commonly signed treaty, actually regulates the ability to take resources uh, from the moon or any other astral object. There, there was a treaty that tried to do this, the moon agreement, but unfortunately only a few countries have signed up to it. So the, quick, the clear answer is if our clients come up to us and said, we've just taken this from the moon, can someone take it off me? wouldn't be a very clear answer, unfortunately, because there's not a clear answer under law as to who's that uh, territory that you took it from it was and whether the assets of that territory actually belong to someone else. We can talk about that in more detail later. Good thing that we have a cheese mountain in Europe. Um, <laughs> Jody, perhaps I should, we should ask you, I'd, I want to come back to Ariel, but perhaps we should just ask you about where the money is actually going at the present time. Jody, Jody Barton. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Andrew. So uh, it's, it's, it's a very interesting time for the sector in respect to financing. So if you go back just a few years, uh, really, um, the only form of financing, as, as, uh, as James alluded to, was, the, uh, was public, public money, really. There was very little private money uh, in the industry. There's exceptions to that, of course, um, but particularly over here in the UK, we've been very frightened by it. It's been outlandish, me going out and, 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 and uh, promoting the space companies sometimes, these poor investors that 
think the only form of space investment is Virgin Galactic and things like that and, and, and shooting people to the moon and things. So it's been an interesting ride. I think there's been two companies in the UK that have really influenced this um, maturity of the finance sector in respect to the space industry. And one of those is Goonhilly um, Earth Station, um, which is the operating company for Goonhilly Holdings. It was founded um, by someone called Ian Jones, uh, all the way back in was it 2000 and uh, when did he find it? Um, 2008, I think. Um, then he raised his for he got his first grant funding in 2011, um, and uh, for about four million, uh, six million, and then he got another four million of funding um, in 2014, um, and that was in venture venture funding, believe it or not. So that was pretty. That was a pretty big deal back then to be able to get venture funding for a, a company that has um, antennas basically talking to space. Um, but his big win was when he got um, Peter Hargreaves to come into the business and invest over 25 million in the business, um, 25 million pounds into the business. And that was a game changer for the for the firm. So what Goonhilly does is they're based down, down in Goonhilly in Cornwall and they have their own antennas. So they have a, a couple really big antennas, GHY3 and GHY6. GHY6 is what you'll be hearing a lot about. It's been promoted by um, NASA and Tim Peaks and, and that sort of thing. And they, they talk to space. They talk to deep space. Uh, it's super interesting. But they also have a business model whereby they rent out. You can put your own antenna on their, on their land and stuff. So they make money from that. Um, so it's a really interesting business model. Um, and they haven't done anything else from a financing perspective, really. They've got some debt in there and things, but nothing, nothing extraordinary. So watch this space with that, with that, with Goon Hilly, in my view. The next company I'd like to talk about is, um, is an investment fund that you've probably, everybody's, most people probably heard of called Seraphim. Seraphim listed on the London Stock Exchange as Seraphim Space Investments PLC um, on the 14th of July last year, and they raised 178.4 million pounds. They're now listed, uh, um, and they uh, they were oversubscribed for that listing, um, but very much so. It was a huge success, and it, it's it's a game changer for the UK space industry. Seraphim success um, because it it demonstrates how mature. Uh, the investing market is in, in the UK now. It's fantastic. It's really good, really good for, for all of us. Um, they, 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 they basically folded in um, their other Seraphim uh, space business. They, they had 19 assets in there. They folded in 15 of those um, at the time of the IPO. And then four of them, they didn't. Uh, and there's a good reason why they didn't initially fold those four in. It's, um, they, those four companies listed themselves so they listed and then and then and then a seraphim folded some of the, some of its assets uh, and did share swaps and things like that with the four with the four outstanding companies. They was in, included in that was Spire, um, Arc, Arquit, um, IC, and D Orbit. So interestingly, Spire uh, and Arquit um, are listed companies on the N, uh, NYSE and the Nasdaq. Um, both of them backed into SPACs. So. Now we're getting the space industry to enter into the SPAC marketplace, which is extraordinary. I mean, traditional companies aren't even in the UK aren't even entering into the SPAC industry. So that's, this is an amazing way to find it. What does Seraphim do? So Seraphim is an investment trust. So they have money, they have cash to invest into space companies, basically. And they invest in a wide um variety of the infrastructure, as James mentioned, the infrastructure in the space industry. So all of those categories that James mentioned, Seraphim probably has a piece of action in, in, in all of those, except for launch, I would say. So they're trying to create their own ecosystem, basically. Very clever. They're one of the first investors in Leo Labs, which you guys might know, which is the cool company that tracks satellites. You pay them to track your satellite. Um, but they've got, you know, they've got quantum cryptography, uh, one of the leading quantum cryptography companies in their portfolio. They've got um, Hawkeye, which is a radio frequency data uh, company. They've invested at least $25 million into that. Um, so they invest, they invest in companies. They also have something called a Seraphim Space Camp. 
which they've had, that's been around for over a decade. Um, and it's so cool. It's a, it's like an incubator. So, you know, a lot of the commercial banks, Andrew, have these incubators that they incubate early state startup companies, basically. So Seraphim does, has been doing the same in the space industry for a very long time, quietly. Um, they incubate the companies and then they, they blossom, uh, hopefully, uh, or a good portion of them do, and then they invest in them. Um, so, I mean, an example, so, they, so they've so they got those tiny little companies that they invest in through the space camp. Um, and then, you know, you've got companies like, uh, they've got, uh, you know, a nice little holding in um, in ICE and Deorbit. Well, Deorbit is, I think Deorbit's the one that's got a valuation of about, an enterprise value of about 1.28 billion when it listed or something. I mean, the, the, they've got such a range of, of companies. There aren't, they aren't um, precious about a, you needing to generate revenue or be profitable or, or anything like that. They're building out, they're, they're deploying a plan, an investment plan that, as James mentioned, has specific uh, um, criteria in respect to risk. Okay, well, look, look, let me bring Ariel back in because that's a UK, I mean, despite the accent, that's a UK view. Uh, Ariel, what, I mean, are these sort of chicken shit numbers in comparison with what's going on in the US or is the UK a player here? And what really is going on in the US? Where is the money going? Is it private money? Where's the private money in particular going? Sure. I'd say the UK absolutely is a player here. So we are very tapped in with VCs in the US market, but also are interested in potential UK investment. We know about Seraphim, uh, C5 Capital, another group that I think is a, a UK based um, investment firm, just announced a major space SPAC with a mentor of mine, Rob Meyerson, as the CEO, which is fantastic news. So I'd say absolutely UK is a space player. We're you know an investment player. We watch that market as well. In the US, what's gotten us excited is that we have seen a shift away from just satellite startups really being the core of what the space market um, can support to Axiom Space, for example, a space habitat company raising a $130 million Series B round last year, which was great to see. They are a company trying to build a commercial space habitat in low Earth orbit. They essentially want to be a business park of the future in low Earth orbit. And if those kind of ecosystems can blossom, then lots of other startups can be motivated uh, to serve or to provide services within that habitat ecosystem. And so I think we'll begin to see a broader willingness to invest in companies that are not just like Planet Labs or Spire or these uh, companies that have been very successful, but were really predicated on selling data back to Earth citizens. Now we want to see if there are if there's a killer app or a business case that will close for uh, in space, life in space, habitat work. What, uh, what, where are you seeing the business, um, James? I mean, you know, where's, where's the business coming? Which part of, space is awfully big. Which part is actually <laughs> looking as though it might uh, produce some real business? Well, I mean, it's every, every element of the uh, capitalist sphere has probably got an analog developing in space so capital markets for example like that uh, <laughs> <laughs> um you know jody makes some great points uh and i think i'll pick out two but there's a fusion there for us as lawyers so first of all it is retail now i mean seraphim is available to uk retail investors um we actually acted scan acted for the first ever human spaceflight company going public um which was virgin galactic actually in 2019 and that was a one and a half billion dollar merger with our client um head of sophia you know, there's a whole uh, element of retail getting exposure effectively to space and capital markets learning their way to uh, to accommodate these these rather unusual, super high tech, super expensive businesses. So those two things colliding are very um, interesting areas for, for us lawyers. The whole development of uh, security, the law of security is very interesting for us. Um, working on the finance agreements. They've got to adapt to effectively typical infrastructure type agreements um, to assisting our clients going into debt or convertible positions in different businesses which need to launch. Um, the, 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 whole, the whole area of uh, design and technology, obviously technology, every, everything is technology nowadays, but, but lawyers, obviously for, for us, crawling all over the IP of these space tech businesses is vital because these could be incredibly valuable technologies for the future. So making sure that's locked down. And in fact, how do you protect some of this IP, specifically if it's being deployed in space? Um, and I guess there's also 
for us, where, where's the money going? I suppose the money is also going into um, things that have actually been done by the by, by the various governments in the past, but now private sector is seeing huge opportunities to to create a model that then is sellable. So, for example, um, we we know of one uh, particular actor in, in it's headquartered in France actually. And they're, they're called Space Able, and they're very much into creating essentially a very useful. Uh, Google Maps essentially for space, um, and they're just one example. But they want to create a model whereby they could avoid help help users avoid collisions, track um, the existence of solar storms, uh, and predict actually solar storms because that's one of the biggest risks to satellite operators. And create a very useful interactive map um, for the, for third party users uh, to be able to navigate their world their world around um, them once they're up in the cosmos. Um, so that's an incredibly valuable area. If you think about how much the world has benefited from having GPS and a, and a very user-friendly ability to get around and to track various things, the replication of that in space is an incredibly interesting area. So I, so I would say all, all of those things are incredibly interesting for us. I just want to make one comment on the, the this, this question, Andrew, but picking up your chicken shit comment. Um, I'm sticking up for a particular champion of the UK here called OneWeb, which was a spin out of Google. You know, OneWeb would, definitely be an investable business. They're obviously focused on uh, launch of satellites and they would they would consider them very much themselves a, a, a rival to and a competitor with the Starlink project in the US. They've got state funding from the UK, state funding from France and a, and a significant degree of private investment capital as well. Um, and that is very much focused on being one of the leaders of satellite launches uh, uh, in the world to deliver internet. Um, although intriguingly, OneWeb, just to bring it back to today, OneWeb was um, refused access to beaming down the internet to Russia um, if it were to launch satellites which overflew Russia. And I think as a result of today and yesterday's events, you can start to see why. So it is an incredibly uh, volatile space for them, but it's also a very interesting space from a financial perspective. And, and OneWeb shouldn't be forgotten in this well, discussion. That's, that's obviously has a great Sorry. tie with MIT as well. Actually, several MIT research scientists, Whitney Lohmeyer, Kerry Cahoy, have been involved in OneWeb. So I appreciate James bringing that up. But you, you've brought up one thing, and that is the political risk attached to, to this. And that I certainly would, would really appreciate you, James, you having uh, expanding on a little bit more. But can I also ask you another question? We are moving into a higher interest rate environment. Up until now, there has been lots of liquidity sloshing around, looking for interesting ventures. What happens if interest rates, real interest rates, rise quite sharply? Is some of the is this funding going to be choked off? I think it's a great question. Maybe Jody's a better place person to answer. Always, always, always ask a banker, not a lawyer, questions like that. I suppose my take, Jody, you can shoot this down, um, is that yeah, in an interest rate environment where we have got plus zero interest costs. I think the funding is going to look for more monetizable opportunities and not these big um, gambles, these moonshots, to use a phrase, uh, which is all about growth in the IP. They will be looking for opportunities to launch satellites, which can then sell internet services, for example, or other transmission or data storage capabilities, because they're clearly going to deliver a return on investment matching um, the interest rate costs of those funders. But Jody, I'm, I'm going to stop there in case I say something stupid. Yeah, so I mean, I think more more you want to look at inflation, Andrew. I think that in, in interest rates, inflation should should correlate to an extent, but interest rates aren't going to go to a level which will be prohibitive to um, uh, the capital markets in particular. It, it's inflation that's going to going to hit the capital markets um, and uh, investors' pockets because it, it trickles down to everybody. So that that's the worry: is if inflation in the UK and, and the US, uh, Europe, um, ha, uh, hits that seven that the golden number of seven, which is creeping up to, that's when um, our jobs become very 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 difficult. But saying that, you know, I, I think that um, investors are, are anticipating it. So there, that's why I, it, it, there's a big rush to uh, to get your money um, invested today. Because you know, when an investor doesn't doesn't make uh, e even if the interest rate was one and a half percent or two percent, right, or three percent, he's still not going to make the. You know, Seraphim has a track record of about a thirty one percent IRR. You know, and that's investing in companies that, you know, start out with zero revenue sometimes. Um, so you're not going to make those kind of returns just sitting on your cash in the bank ever again. Um, and so you need to put it to work. So 
really that's that's the key it's it's the blend of what you invest in though that's the key if you're investing as an individual um you you've got to you've got to find a blend that suits your risk profile and, and investors do the same thing so what we do at city court is we make sure with our companies that we we go to really really qualified investors for that specific investment because we're in the market so much we know what everybody's investing in in our in our network and what specifically they're looking for. And, and we try to go to those specific um, sort of investors. And we, you know, we, these days we have to keep up to date with our investors. They used to put, you know, put their, their um, investment strategy out once a year and I knew exactly what it was. And now it changes, you know, once every couple of months. So you got it. It's difficult. And it's difficult for companies because, you know, companies used to be able to say, oh, OK, you know, you look at all these Seraphim investments. They've done round. They've done Series F, Series D, Series A, C financing, all of that across the board. But since since their IPO. But, you know, they, they you know, that they're an example of a company that has enough cash to be able to do that. So it's, it's usually a percentage of their portfolio that they put in these various risk categories. Um, so the early stage businesses are the highest risk in, in every. It's, it's more than that, isn't it? Because Seraphim, the, the, the businesses into which Seraphim has gone are a mix. Some of them, as it were, are real world, earth based um, High tech, but, but earth based ventures. And some are, as you say, moonshots. Uh, and, you know, the one is financing the other at the present time. Is that not fair? Yes, you're completely right. Yeah. Yeah. So the pure, I mean, the, the pure space, space shot, as it were, um, is, it, is it really a, a profitable or can it be profitable at the present time? Yeah. So well, what you're finding, Andrew, is a lot of companies that are going into the space com space industry and being invested in are traditional companies that want to apply their technology to space. So they're profitable businesses oftentimes. Yeah. 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 So it's not just companies that have developed their technology specifically for space yeah. sector. But then let me let me ask um, Ariel whether, in, in her opinion, she worries about the impact of inflation and higher real interest rates, not just nominal interest rates, but higher real interest rates on the appetite to take these moonshot decisions. We worry about it for donors. Uh, I think our posture is a little bit different. We're an academic institution. Um, I'm not typically courting as much direct investment, and so I'm probably not as familiar with it as James and Jody would be, but we worry about it a little bit if it'll change um, where donors or research grant money or, you know, U.S. government dollars, um, where we get a lot of the funding for projects, if that is impacted, then that would have a problem for us. We did decide recently actually to spin a new effort out of MIT, which we're quite excited about, but we explicitly structured it as a nonprofit. It's a blue sky research institute. We want to work on the you know, future of space architecture and space habitats. And we knew that it's because it's a deep tech, long horizon project, we needed that safety of the nonprofit and getting it funded by you know, philanthropic groups. And then our hope is to be able to stand up a fund uh, or have an incubation studio or a venture studio that is for profit that sits next to this nonprofit. And when the market timing is right and when the technologies have matured and have the benefit of this protected incubation space, kind of like Seraphim and their space camp, but with even more expertise in terms of MIT, getting them past regulation, helping them really mature, know their market well, then we can spin them out. Um, but for us, we see, and maybe in, you know, affected by inflation and rising interest rates, we do see a long horizon for some of the space shot work that we want to work on. Let me ask James, I mean, the Europe and the UK, I mean, are, are the governments here on this side of the Atlantic supportive or supportive to the extent that you would like them to be supportive, not just, I suppose, in money, but also in pushing the appropriate regulatory environment, uh, the advancing the, 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 the possibility of UK or English law being key. Uh, it's always been a key advantage to the City of London that we have mm. English law um, as a sort of almost a universal law. Yeah, there's a few things there to unpack. I mean, just to take the English law point first, obviously, that's something that we as lawyers would always like to advertise because of its you know relative certainty we've got a lot of precedent but 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 but, but as i've said earlier um that's great for a private contract but when it comes to you know concepts of international law and working out the proper uh, fora for litigating for any damage that's an entirely different ball game and 
countries are now writing their own laws. I don't think they're going to step aside for the English view of international law, however much of a, a deep provenance we have in it. But absolutely, when it comes to finance contracts, investing contracts, New York law or English law, a, a great place to start, I would say, um, not, not the be all and end all of the conversation. In terms of your other, um, the first component of your question, great question. I personally feel, and I, I welcome Jody's view and Ariel's view from a US perspective as well, um, I actually feel the UK government is supportive. I mean, they famously stepped in to support OneWeb actually two years ago um, after a round of private uh, capital had effectively been used up. And the French government are also invested in OneWeb, which is a really interesting post-Brexit phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, and I think generally speaking, there's, there's some fraying around the edges, particularly regarding uh, the, the various um, European space projects now that the uk is is, is out of the european union there's, there's been some spats over investing in in the but european we're still union. in the various some of the space programs are we? We, we we are but that is a that is an area that's a volatile area right now we, we're threatening to withdraw from one or two of them because we're not getting value for money or access to the supply chain that we want so that's a that's a work in progress i would say but i would say generally speaking there is a general understanding between governments within europe and i mean that in the broader sense that space is something that has to be got right. And I wouldn't say the UK and the EU are at loggerheads. In fact, they're probably more aligned, um, I would say loosely aligned, but they're more aligned amongst themselves vis-a-vis -vis, uh, countries like China, who are seeking to, to be first mover advantage um, takers in the law space, in the actuality space. So landing on the far side of the moon, for example. Um, Russia who just chose to blow up its own satellite completely in disregard of the due regard principle under the mm -hmm. Outer Space Treaty. I, I actually see the UK and the European Union quite aligned internationally in, in resisting that kind of behaviour, mm -hmm. uh, as well as supporting their, their environments. A big shout out for Scotland here in that Scotland's a great place to launch satellites which go pole to pole as opposed to around the equator. <laughs> you know, the UK government is, is spotting an opportunity to bring the two nations, England and Scotland, closer together, and they're putting money and resource into developing a a satellite uh, business um, up in up in the north of Scotland and the Orkneys. So I think at, at the supporting level, I'm quite happy with how the UK and the EU are functioning. But but I'm really interested in Jody or Ariel's take. Yeah, yeah. Jody. Yeah, so d definitely, we were working on a project at the minute with a, a company that's based in Wales, a space company based in Wales, and it's received loads of funding from the Welsh government, which is absolutely fantastic. So not from a, a, a legal law perspective, but from a funding perspective extremely extremely helpful they've received also recently a bit of funding from the spanish government they've got a spanish division which is which is interesting but they have received an enormous amount of grant funding um, in the uk you've got two really good sources of government funding um, uh, mechanisms so you got catapult which is enormously successful that's backed by the government and they're extremely influential and innovate uk which is also backed uh, by the government and most space companies that I know that start or started as as you know startups we have received money from one or both of those and not only money but support and the government's very very involved they sit on the boards of these funds and you know even uh, believe it or not the uh, Prince Charles has recently gotten involved and I understand had a few meetings with um, some of these guys uh, to to talk to him about um, space debris that he wanted to learn more about space debris and things like that. So he, you know, face-to-face -face sessions and things. So, um, I mean, putting the regulations together for launch has been very, very dip made my some of my transactions very difficult because it's been very slow moving. Um, I must admit, but yeah, I mean, my experience is they're really on it big time. ESA's can, I, can I ask Ariel about the, the the threat of the threat of China? Is it a threat? Is you know, China China is plowing ahead. I mean. Russia has an economy the size of Spain. I mean, it may be able to invade Ukraine, but you know, it has an economy the size of Spain. It is not long term a major technological threat, but China is. Mm -hmm. How? What's your view of the Chinese threat? So we do take it quite seriously at MIT in terms of IP protection and and thinking about the crossover technologies that could be shared or could not be shared. Of course, we're governed by ITAR and export control in a way that many um, advanced space technology groups are. 
one of the things that we often use about is even in the height of the Cold War in the US, we have these stories about how the space program was actually an avenue of cooperation and collaboration between the US and Russia. So we had um, astronauts being trained together, participation with Mir, joint participation on the International Space Station, even around the fall of the Soviet Union. We, well, I should say, I'm not sure exactly who I mean by we in this moment, I certainly don't speak for the US, but I do think that there's a lot of academic interest in finding a way to have collaborative, cooperative work with China and having the space program be an example of setting good norms of behavior. And if we continue to wall ourselves off and say we absolutely won't work with them, then for sure we will develop these different siloed ecosystems um, that might not be interoperable. They may have very different norms of behavior in terms of operating on the lunar environment or the lunar surface. Um, in LEO as well, of course, we now know that the Chinese are working on Tiangong, their own commercial space or their own government private um, space station. Um, thinking about the US, so just to answer the question that um, James and Jody answered from the UK side, in the US, what I think is interesting for our regulatory environment is we're seeing a whole of government approach to space, which we hadn't really seen before. It was NASA, and DOD, you know, government um, uh, classified space work. Now, Commerce Department in U.S. is getting really involved. FAA, of course, has already been involved for regulation, but the National Security Council under Biden is more interdisciplinary, whole of government approach, which I think is really exciting. And in terms of the crossover between are we kind of in this Western society group, US and Europe and the UK, are we working well together? We certainly are seeing some momentum around things like the Artemis Accords. So these countries coming together, it's whether it's, you know, James is smiling here, it's, whether it's enforceable or really has any teeth to it yet to be seen, but at least it's a sentiment that we do want to stay united around certain norms of behavior um, and need to have those conversations with Russia and China about how to how to try to have some level of cooperation and shared planning. But you are, I mean, export controls are very fierce and, and there have been so many concerns in the United States about the loss of IP, uh, particularly to China and split loyalties of Chinese Americans and all sorts of things like this. Is this really affecting the business? Uh, is it affecting the discipline that you're a part of? There are certainly very crisp rules at MIT about what we can and cannot do. So yes, we follow those rules and it does affect the ability that we have to uh, collaborate and cooperate. Um, I think it's pretty clear how MIT wants us to behave. And so I don't think it is stymieing our work. Um, I think it's actually necessary and adequate protections for national security. And I come from a military family background, so I'm perfectly willing to operate within that um, you know, apparatus and follow those rules for MIT. I don't think it's stymieing us, but I do think, um, and I think it's in place for a good reason to protect IP in the United States. Um, but I would love to see some openings, whether it's having a Taikonaut, you know, be able to come and join academic discussion panels with us. You know, we bring cosmonauts and astronauts from all over the world. It's still very hard to make contact and really um, build even just research uh, intellectual collaborations um, with some different groups in China. And my understanding, though I'm certainly not an expert here, is that there's a bit of a difference in China with how they run their space program. It is intimately and deeply tied and connected with their military. There's not necessarily a NASA, a civilian, you know, easy to collaborate with civilian to civilian side. Mm -hmm. And so that's also something that we think about. Okay, can I just, we've, we've really got just less than five minutes, just, uh, but let me ask, what would you like to see um, in terms of uh, major changes, uh, not, not necessarily major changes, but what would you like to see that would really advance the industry of space? I mean, if you're looking over the next three or four years, what do we need to push it? Jody, is there anything that, that either government or private industry can do? Or indeed, you know, the intervention of God to actually to, to, to produce a, a legal framework that, that mere mortals can't. Jody, yeah. what, are, what are the big obstacles that still exist and still need to be overcome? From a financing perspective, we need more forms of finance, traditional financing in the space sector. So we need commercial banks to get on side and comfortable with investing in the space industry. I mean, it's it's complex. Uh, it's generally complex technologies going 
um, into the uh, into these um, into these satellites, for example, or into the different technologies and the ecosystems and things. And um, you know, the, the, they need to be able to understand it enough to be able to start lending to some of these companies. Obviously, the companies need to get to the point where they can service debt. I mean, I know a platform at the minute that um, issues bonds, uh, issues bonds, and does crowdfunding um, uh, for and, and then and and then um, gives gives companies um, provides debt to companies off the back of that, which is interesting. So we need more forms of financing. We need more venture venture financing in the space sector but we i mean that that's that's affected by the perception of risk i mean the and is uh, are we are we overdoing the risk of investing in in space in your opinion yeah it's purely down to people not understanding it because they uh, so what you find with investors is that you, the person you're talking to across the table is not the person that, generally that's going to make the final decision he makes it with a team or she makes it with a team and so he, he or she needs to explain it to a team so you need to be able to and what a lot of space people do you know it's like Andrew you get in a room of space people and you got you know a, a, you know several universes of brain cells <laughs> in one room and they uh, overcomplicate it rather than simplify it. So what we do at CityCord is we simplify investments for investors. So that they can, it's not that they won't understand themselves so that they can explain it to other people. Um, but as you say, with the popularity of it, as you know, as James mentioned, everything, popularity of the space industry, people are slowly but surely starting to understand it's not just about putting people on space. Ariel, your, your view, where, where, where might we hope for, for progress and what's holding us back? Our raison d'etre for this organization at MIT is to try to show a broader swath of humanity that space can include them and actually build a future for life in space that appeals to more people. And I think we'd be surprised, those of us that are in the space industry, how far we actually really do have to go to convince average everyday citizens that there is a role for them in space, that there's enough technology to support a robust, richly envisioned, enjoyable life in space where they can thrive and have it not just be a survival pioneer type thing. And to do that, what I think we need is to pull in more adjacent industries. So um, a big AIAA effort that I consult for here in the States is looking at how do you bring in Apple and Disney and Microsoft, um, really big name companies and uh, BP. Um, and infrastructure companies like Bechtel, like a really wide range of adjacent industries to show that space is going mainstream and it'll help these different companies and the, the success of the ecosystem to have a robust group of mature companies that are also realizing this space future. So that's what I'm looking forward to seeing is more activity of adjacent industries realizing that space is no longer the domain of just Virgin Galactic and SpaceX and Blue Origin and OneWeb, um, as great as those companies are. I assume that's what the FT is uh, is trying to generate with its uh, conference on uh, investing in space in June. The final word is with you, James. What uh, what 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 are you looking for? Um, well, ask a lawyer and you get a lawyer's question. I guess to make this industry um, sector investable uh, on a more certain basis, of course, I'm going to want a greater uh, rigidity in the legal architecture. And I'd, I'd be calling for something that I fondly call CASA, uh, a convention on the architecture of space advancement. And the thing is, that's happened. We sorted it out with Antarctica in the mid 20th century. We sorted it out with a convention on the law of the sea. I, there, is a, there is a world, I hope, where we can bring nations together. Maybe it involves giving the UN through its committee, standing committee on space, um, some teeth, some enforceable teeth. Uh, so that there are some real remedies available to private actors and national actors. Uh, and I'd like to see more collaboration. I think, um, you know, we, we, we talk about China as a threat, but I think people assume we mean a military threat. I think it's a commercial threat as much as anything. I know the military and, and space uh, sector are, are very much combined there, but, you know, we have to treat China as effectively wanting its own way in space. And just like any commercial actor, we have to negotiate with them. They put an awful lot of thought into the law of space. They've got a huge number of academics designing space and space law, I would say, do our best. It's going to take five, 10 years. We have cars of one, we have cars of two, we have cars of three, however long it takes, 15, 20 years. We've got to get the, the nations around the table to agree on some basic concept about who owns the products from space, how can they be taxed, and where can the rights of private actors be enforced and defended? Is that realistic? I mean... Well, I would point, people would have said that it wasn't realistic for Antarctica. Well, you know, Antarctica was a mess. We had 16 different nations put soldiers there and claim rights to it. We managed to come up with an Antarctic treaty. Okay, it's you know a bit ropey, 
Same with the law of the sea. It was a mess despite Grotius's efforts in the 16th century. We got the nations together and you know, some nations don't sign up to it. It is doable. It's just an awfully tall order. Um, I, I agree there's, there's skepticism in that, but uh, until you start devoting legal, financial, national and sovereign brain power to it, you don't know what the solutions are. And you think that the UN should take the lead on that? It's, it's the most obvious organ because they've got a convening power that no other in, in, you know, supranational body has. They've got this committee on the peaceful uses of outer space, COPUOS, which has been there for many decades already. It's just got no enforceability mm-hmm. powers. You know, we can start with that architecture, but as we're seeing with Ukraine, you know, there's a limit to what the UN can do or what they mean. So maybe we have to start a different organization, but it certainly Cars is just our catch-all phrase for how we think, you know, Spanish for home. This is our home, but our home now encompasses space. Let's write the rules. Mm-hmm. We have home away from home. Can I thank James? Can I thank Ariel and Jody, and of course, all of you for watching? Many, many thanks. <laughs>